gastroesophageal reflux disease, or abbreviated GERD, is the topic. And uh, GERD essentially is a very common uh, condition that can occur. And uh, I'll draw a diagram of the stomach here. And above the stomach is, of course, this tube called the, the esophagus. And at the lower end of the esophagus, you have uh, these muscles that are essentially known as the LES, which is lower esophageal sphincter. And the LES actually plays a very important role in GERD. And what that does is that periodically you have something called T-LESR. And what that means is T for transient, transient or temporary, lower esophageal sphincter relaxations. See, the lower esophageal sphincter essentially are muscles that, when closed, prevent uh, the contents of the stomach from going back. So I mean, let's say you have some food or some acid. And really what we're talking about is acid. When this is closed, um, the, the acid doesn't go back because it's not supposed to. But what happens in GERD is that you have these relaxations. And when that happens, the unfortunate uh, thing is that the acid goes back into the esophagus. And that's really the heart of uh, the GERD, is that th this transient lower esophageal sphincter relaxation. So please remember that. Now, why does this happen? Well, there's a long list of reasons that this lower esophageal sphincter uh, can relax. And here are some of the factors, causes. The first one is obesity that can contribute. Certain uh, types of foods, such as fatty foods. Uh, certain type of beverages, such as caffeinated beverages or carbonated be beverages. Also alcohol, tobacco, smoking. And uh, certain medications as well. The symptoms of GERD, by far the number one symptom is heartburn, which is extremely common uh, in the general population. It's estimated that as many as 20% of people can experience GERD in their lifetime, which is extremely high. Not as common, but sometimes these symptoms can occur, such as cough or uh, hoarseness as well. And if it progresses, you can get difficulty swallowing or pain during sw swallowing. So difficulty swallowing is dysphagia, and pain during swallowing is known as odynophagia. But this is, of course, very serious, late complications. Now, remember GERD, which is gastroesophageal reflux disease, can lead to acid going up into the esophagus. So that can lead to inflammation of the esophagus. So we're talking about GERD. We're also talking about esophagitis. They're kind of... They kind of go hand in hand. So how you diagnose this? Most of the time, it's really just a clinical diagnosis based on history. Uh, most of the time, a, a physician won't really do any tests, just prescribe the relevant medication. But if it is very serious or long-term, then you do an EGD, which is a esophago, uh, esophago gastro duodenoscopy. Basically, a, a test where you put a tube down the throat and has a camera attached to it and you can take a look at what's going on in the stomach also sometimes known as endoscopy uh, once in a while the doctor might do a pH testing it's not really done that commonly in the diagnosis of GERD but this is a 24-hour pH testing is uh, definitely one of the tests that can be done now one thing that uh, I wanted to mention before I jump into the treatment is that the EGD is actually very important to try to detect something that can be a complication of GERD and that's known as Barrett's esophagus. Now what happens is if somebody's had GERD for a long time like many years the um, cells in the lower portion of the esophagus can undergo metaplasia and what that means is that the cells can change and in response to all the acid that they've constantly been in contact with. 
And normally you have squamous epithelium in the lower part of the uh, esophagus. And this can undergo metaplasia, which is a change in the type of cell, to columnar epithelium. And columnar epithelium is usually found in the GI tract. And when this happens, this is known as metaplasia, and it's given a special name when it happens in the lower part of the esophagus. It's called Barrett's esophagus. Now, the problem or the worrisome thing about this is that this can progress to cancer. So if someone has GERD for many years, they can get Barrett's esophagus, so it's very important to do this EGD. Uh, maybe every one to two years for someone who's had GERD for many, many years. So that's very important to remember. Treatment. Well, before we jump into the meds, the first advice is always lifestyle management. So lifestyle. Now the lifestyle changes we're referring to is you can elevate the head of the bed. That's uh, commonly recommended. Uh, change uh, diet, so diet modification, uh, such as cutting out the foods or beverages uh, that cause or can contribute to that lower esophageal sphincter relaxing. And those include you no know, alcohol, uh, coffee, fatty foods, no smoking, things like that. So that's the first part of the treatment. If that's been tried and it's still not effective, then you can go to the medications. And there's two big types of meds. The first one is known as a proton pump inhibitor. And then the next one is H2 blockers. Of these, uh, this is the more serious one. So if you kind of had to pick, this is sort of like for mild GERD. And this is more for moderate to severe GERD. Now I'll just give you some names. One of the most common proton pump inhibitors is omeprazole. And one of the most common uh, H2 blockers is ranitidine. And each of these, of course, have brand names as well. So let's take a look at some clinical vignettes. And here we go. 37-year-old woman comes to the office because of burning sensation in the chest for the past three months. The burning typically begins in the upper stomach and travels up to the neck. Symptoms worsen when she lies down and goes to sleep. She tries to eat a healthy diet, but it is difficult because she is around food all day and night. She has no chronic medical conditions, takes no meds, does not drink alcohol or caffeine-containing beverages. She recently quit smoking. Temperature is 98, blood pressure is 120, pulse is 65, respirations are 14. Physical exam is unremarkable. EKG is unremarkable. CBC of metabolic profile are normal. Serologic testing for H. pylori is negative. Most appropriate next step is 2. Looks like she's got some heartburn. She's fairly young. She's only 37. And they uh, did all these tests to rule out other causes, you know, cardiac-related causes. So most likely a, a relatively young woman with some heartburn very first thing you want to tell her is just change her lifestyle before jumping to any serious testing or medications. So that would probably just be choice C, which is avoid certain foods before bedtime and elevate the head of the bed. Next question. A 35-year-old man comes to the office because of heartburn for three months. He tells you that he has had burning sensation in his chest that begins in the upper stomach and travels up to the neck. Symptoms worsen when he lies down. He typically Typically drinks two to three cups of coffee a day, has a glass of wine after dinner, and has a piece of chocolate-covered peppermint candy before bedtime. You recommend that he elevate the head of the bed, avoid eating before bed, and avoid all alcohol, tobacco, chocolate, caffeine, and schedule a follow-up visit. He comes back to the office after two months and says that his symptoms are unchanged. The most appropriate next step is two. You recommended the lifestyle changes. They didn't work. It's unchanged, so now it's time to give him some meds. And, uh, you know, there's two kinds, of course. There's the H2 blockers, and then there's the proton pump inhibitors, PPIs. And the most common, well, not most common, but one of the most common uh, H2 blockers is uh, ranitidine, and famotidine is an H2 blocker. 
Uh, omeprazole is a very common proton pump inhibitor, and omeprazole is not one of the choices. Uh, three months is a very short time, so I don't think he needs an EGD just quite yet. And some of these other tests are not really necessary. You kind of already know the diagnosis. You, you knew the diagnosis when he came in, the initial visit, and because that's when you recommended the lifestyle changes. So you already know that it's GERD. Now he just needs a medication. So the answer would be C. And then finally, a 54-year-old obese man gives a history of burning, retrosternal pain, and heartburn that is brought about by bending over, wearing a tight belt, or lying flat in bed at night. He gets symptomatic relief from over-the-counter antacids or H2 blockers, but has never been formally studied or treated. Um, the problem has been present for many years and seems to be progressing. Which of the following is the most appropriate next step? Well, the most important part of this clinical vignette is the many years. If someone has had a heartburn uh, for many years, um, GERD for many years can sometimes lead to Barrett's esophagus. And if you remember, Barrett's esophagus is when you have this metaplasia where the lower part of the esophagus, because of chronic exposure to acid, can change uh, from one type of cell to another. And in particular, what we're referring to is uh, changing from squamous to columnar epithelium. What's unfortunate about this is that in some cases, Barrett's can lead to uh, cancer. So what they recommend is that every one to two years that you do a uh, endoscopy where you go and uh, do this EGD test which is an esophageal gastro duonoscopy where it's a tube that you put down the throat it has a camera and it takes a look inside the esophagus and stomach so that would be an endoscopy and then while you're doing the endoscopy you can take a small sample of the esophagus and send it to the lab and then the pathologist can take a look at the cells and that's known of course as a biopsy so the correct uh, answer to this question would be endoscopy and biopsy which is choice D